You can turn in your King James Bible to the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. Doing a sermon request today. Um, got this in the mail not long ago, and uh, they want to remain anonymous, so they will remain anonymous. Um, it was a very good request. And the question is, is it wrong for a Christian to have no real friends? Um, society tells us that we have to have a lot of friends and acquaintances, and if you don't have, if you're not very popular and you don't really get along with people and whatever, then something's wrong with you. Um, but what does the Bible say about that? So let's uh, begin here in Isaiah 53, verse 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Let's start out with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this amazing King James Bible and for the great history that we have as Bible-believing Christians, uh, that we can read this hundreds of years separated from brethren in the past and know that we went through the same struggles and we went through the same things, Lord. And this passage that uh, was a prophecy in the Old Testament of you when you came to the earth as the Messiah and the Jewish people, they rejected you as their Messiah. Um, and they deny that this is about you, but we know that it is. And uh, we can read it, Lord, and we can see that uh, you suffered you didn't have it easy down here on the earth. And um, just an amazing thing, Lord. And I pray that these passages of Scripture that we go through today would be a great comfort to the people out there watching this video, the people who have been put down by the world and, and uh, had their name cast out as evil. And I pray that we would all find our comfort in the Scriptures and in the fellowship of the Spirit. And I pray it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we read there in Isaiah chapter 53 about that uh, Jesus was not very popular. Um, he was despised. He was rejected. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. In other words, grief wasn't something that just happened on, you know, maybe once a year or something. No, he was acquainted with it. It was a daily thing for the Lord. I mean, I still cannot fathom coming down here to this earth as the creator and you're walking along among your creation and you're just seeing all the sin and the wickedness. Absolutely terrible to go through that. How's it going for you? Do you have some fellowship of the Spirit with the Lord? It, how's it when you walk out among the lost world out there and you see all those people that could, they couldn't care less about Jesus Christ, they couldn't care less about the King James Bible? Um, who is God? They walk around down here and they see the, the majesty of his creation and they, they throw the trash into it. They don't care. It gets pretty lonely. John chapter 15. Go to the New Testament. John chapter 15. Verse 13 through 21. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. What are friends? Let's keep reading. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that ye should go forth and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. You know, the world doesn't love Jesus. 
it doesn't. They try to change his name. They try to make him into somebody that he's not. And well, he was a created being. Well, he's just the second person of the Trinity. He's, you know, the Archangel Michael. He was a ascended master. He was a prophet. Um, they don't like the fact that this is God walking around on the earth. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. There's one body. God has one body. God doesn't have three bodies. Okay. Um, body, soul, spirit. Three parts to one God. That is the Godhead. And the people hate that. They get angry about that. This blows my mind. I don't understand. They say I'm, I'm blaspheming the Lord when I talk about the Godhead doctrine. No, I'm actually promoting the Lord Jesus Christ and saying He's God. But they don't get it. Um, verse 19. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world... But I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they, hate, if they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Um, but all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Uh, now let's just look at something logically here. If Jesus said, the world's going to hate you, does that mean that you would have lots of friends or very few friends? Very few friends. But uh, the key takeaway here in this passage, when you think about God that created everything, the world and everything that's in it, and all the stars and everything else out there, the planets and everything, you think about that and think that he says in this passage, I'm not going to call you my servants anymore, but yet my friends. Wow, that's an incredible thing to think about, isn't it? The Lord looks down here on the earth and he looks and he sees you suffering. And he says, I remember what that was like. Yeah, you know, well, I didn't have to go through the going to the grocery store and you hear all the wicked music and you see people dressed immodestly that they would have never dressed that way in the first century. And. And all the horrible things that people say and do and all the weird things that go on. But um, I remember going through some of that stuff and seeing that and the, the vexation there. And you have that fellowship of the Spirit with the Lord. You know why a lot of times you just feel really down and really depressed? It's because that's the Spirit of the Lord within you. The Bible talks about grieve not the, the Holy Spirit of God, you know, that you're sealed by there paraphrasing a little bit in the book of Ephesians, um, you can grieve the Holy Spirit by your actions. So if you can grieve the Holy Spirit, don't you think the lost world kind of grieves the Holy Spirit a little bit with what he sees and he sees these people doing and he hears from them and whatever else? I'm sure it's a terrible grief to the Lord. And that grief is turning to anger, turning to wrath. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and right, unrighteousness of men. Um, Romans chapter 1 talks about that. The Lord is going to be pouring out His judgment and wrath upon these wicked people. But it starts off with grief. And uh, the, the number one thing that you have to realize when you become a Christian, and I mean a real, true, born-again Christian, where the Lord chooses you, not I made up my mind, I believe, you know, some facts from the Scripture. No. You call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, the Lord hears your prayer. He looks at your life and says, okay, broken, repentant, contrite spirit. They're not just faking a prayer because they got caught up in the emotion or whatever else. No, they truly want to be saved. They believe the gospel. They believe my written word. Okay. Um, and the Lord says, okay, I'm going to save you. 100% of the time, never fails. You will have people turn against you that you thought were your friends. 100% of the time. Always. You say, well, not me. I'm a Christian and I get along with everybody. I, everybody loves me. Then you're not saved. You're not born again. Because if you were, you'd be rejecting the words of Jesus Christ that we just read in the passage there. Jesus said they, they hated me. Why wouldn't they hate you? Is the servant greater than his Lord? You want to be my friend? I'd like to be the friend of the Creator, of God, then get ready for the world to hate you. Get ready to lose friends. Get ready to lose family members. And the most shocking thing of all, 
get ready to have other Christians turn against you. Cast out your name as evil. Evil report. James chapter 4, verse 4. Now, I'll tell you what, um, God doesn't care about your career. God doesn't care about the kind of car you drive or the kind of uh, hairstyle you have or the kind of clothing that you wear or whatever, your education level. You know what your purpose, your main purpose is on this, in this life on earth? To make sure that you're going to go to heaven when you die. To get to know the Creator and submit yourself to His Word, His written Word. That's the main task. There isn't anything more important than that. So you better get it figured out. Well, you know, I don't know. I just this video is entertaining. I like some of the jokes you tell, Brian, and and uh, I'd like to watch you for entertainment. Uh, you're playing with fire, literally playing with fire, eternal fire. Starts out in hell and ends up in the lake of fire after the great white throne judgment. You better get it figured out. Oh, I have time. I I think I have time. Um. Let me just explain something. You can get to the point where you've hardened your heart. See, God's not interested in you coming to Him and saying, okay, I'm ready now. I, I've, I've had my fun, so whatever. God gives you a call. And I don't know how many times He does it. Maybe you didn't understand it correctly the first time and it gives you another time that the Holy Spirit will come and, and plead with you to be saved. And, you know, now's the accepted time. Now's the day of salvation. You know, the Lord doesn't say, well, later is the day of salvation. He says, now, now, and you mess around and mess around and then you miss it. You end up in hell. What a terrible thing. But uh, a lot of people, they don't want to get saved because they start to realize what it's going to cost them. Here's another verse that ties into this whole thing. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You know, I used to be a really good church-going Christian enemy of God. I was the friend of the world. My nieces and nephews loved me. My siblings, um, they were okay with some of the stuff I was doing. They, they thought I was great and a lot of fun to be around and everything. And boy, when I got saved, things changed. Uh, my nieces and nephews don't even have anything to do with me anymore. Oh, it's crazy, Uncle Brian. What do I think? <clears throat> I want to have Jesus as my friend. And what about the your high school? Do you go to your high school reunions? No. You know why? Because Jesus is my friend. That's why. What about the guys you used to ride dirt bike with? You know, ride street bike with and things, you know, going real fast and whatever else and acting crazy with and everything uh, no uh, they don't have anything to do with me either jesus is my friend now i uh, told one of my best friends growing up he said so what are you doing now i said i'm studying the bible <laughs> years ago he laughed at me and i don't blame him i don't blame him because you see uh the man that i used to be uh would never have studied the bible but i was a church going christian i was a good guy no i wasn't and he knew it. And I knew it. So, uh, can you have a friend? Uh, yeah, that would be Jesus. He should be your first and most important friend. But now let's talk about two other types of friends that you can have. And the first one you want to avoid. You say, who's that? Uh, that would be uh, fake friends. Proverbs chapter 19 I get questions from people sometimes, and they say, uh, Brother Brian, you know, I'm, some of my old friends, I'm trying to hang out with them, trying to witness to them, and they, they laugh at me, and they put me down and whatever else. And Should I stick with them? Should I, should I try to, to be there? Should I go? And, but every time I go, they try to get me to compromise. And, and what should I do? Uh, well, you have to watch out for fake friends, and uh, you have to let go of the lost world. Let me show you that. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 6 and 7 says, many will entreat the favor of the prince, and every man is a friend to him that giveth gifts. All the brethren of the poor do hate him, 
How much more do his friends go far from him? He pursueth them with words, yet they are wanting to him. <laughs> um, one of the things the Lord will ha have happen in your life is the Lord will start to convict you of things when you get saved. And all of a sudden you realize, hey, you know what? I can't cheat on my taxes like I used to do. And I can't, I can't lie about this and I can't steal that. And, you know, um, I actually have to have a good work ethic here. I can't just tell the boss that I'm working and go actually down to the break room and, and uh, do whatever, talking and gossiping and whatever else. You know, I actually need to be a good worker here because it says so in the New Testament. Hmm. I better be a, a hard, conscientious worker. You know what? I'm not going to go into debt. And you know, I realize I'm going to be really kicking debt a lot in the future, by the way, because the Lord's really revealing a lot to uh, myself and my wife as we're studying finance type of things and whatever else. It is a huge, big scam. Unreal. Um, and the churches don't preach against it because they're drowning in debt themselves. But you see, when God, whenever God kicks sin in the Bible, it's because he's trying to give you a better replacement, something that's better than that sin. All sin is negative. A key thing here at this ministry, all sin is negative. You get into debt, you are in sin, it is negative. Just the way that it is. But you see what happens when you get out of debt and you're debt free? And you say, hey, I own everything that I have. I have an old beat up vehicle, but you know what? It's mine. It doesn't belong to the bank. I don't have the nicest house, but you know what? It's mine. I don't have some monthly uh, death pledge that I need to pay for. Mortgage, that's what it means. Hey, this is great. I'm debt free. But the lost world looks at you and they say, you're poor. We don't want to be around you. But you wanted to be around me back in the past when I was a party guy. I'd get my paycheck and I'd go out and say, hey, pizza's on me or whatever. Hey, let's go get a movie. I'll pay for it. You know, hey, I bought you this, you know, system here or that thing there or whatever else. Look at my cool cars. Look at my neat motorcycle. Look at the, I had money. Just spend it willingly. Hey, I'd, if I want something and I don't have the money for it, I'll get a loan, you know? And I don't mean a loan <laughs> as in by yourself. I mean, I, you know, bank, borrowing from the bank, <laughs> just to make that clear. Um, well, that guy was a lot of fun in the past, man. Some neat motorcycles, had a Corvette. He was a cool guy. He was neat to be around. Then he got into this Bible stuff and he got rid of all of his cool, you know, things and whatever. And he's got this old rundown house, you know, in northern Maine and whatever. What a loser. What a weirdo, you know. Lives out in the middle of nowhere in some property and, it, you know, lives in some kind of shed or some kind of trailer or something. I don't know what he's living in out there. Guy's a weirdo. Um, so you like me when I had money or the illusion of money. Okay, um, my in-debt stuff. People liked me then. I was a lot of fun, very worldly. I was trying to work my way up. You know what my dream was? I actually made this statement as a young man in my early twenty, in my early twenties. Excuse me. Oh, hiccups there. Um, I actually made the statement the one time to my best friend at the time. I said, "I am never going to get married until I own a Dodge Viper." The V10 Dodge Viper, you know, and everything. I wanted a six speed and I had it all figured out in my head. I was going to save up. It was, you know, they're fifty, sixty thousand dollars and I had it in my mind. I'm going to hit it big as a wood turning artist. And when I make a lot of money, I'm going to buy a Dodge Viper because my Corvette's pretty cool, but I want a Viper, you know, and I had it all just, well, that didn't work out. I thank the Lord it didn't. Uh, the circles that I was starting to get into with the high end art world and whatever else, uh, filthy new age chicks that uh, didn't have a problem with fornication before marriage. Um, thankfully, I never fell for any of them, but uh, it would have gotten to that point had I continued in the art world, end up with some woman that's probably into witchcraft or whatever else that hated the Lord or something. Um, I sure thank the Lord he got me out of that. Say, well, you went from making a lot of money to, you know, giving things away for free. Yeah, how about that? And yet I'm happier today. Made a lot of enemies, though, with the world. Where'd that guy go? He was really an up-and-coming, you know, part of the Lancaster Guild of Master Craftsmen. And, and I was joining, going to join the Pennsylvania Guild of Master Craftsmen. And he's in some of the best galleries out there. What happened to him? Didn't you hear? <laughs> he got religion. 
left the whole thing, man. What a weirdo. Some idiot now on YouTube, and he makes these videos and things. People hate his guts. There's all kinds of websites exposing the guy. He's a real loser. Friend of the, the, uh, the Lord, enemy of the world. Oh, well. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. You know, you'll get to the point, brethren. Again, oh, Brother Brian, you're so you're light years ahead. Not really. Um, just, to, just to encourage you. You'll get to the point, brethren, where you will be attacked so much, and you just kind of eventually you say, I know what the Bible says. I know I'm in, in line with the Scriptures. I know there's prophecy here. I'm seeing it out there in the world. I know these things. Um I don't care what the lost people think. I don't care what my former friends say or what my family members say. They're not my friends anymore. I want Jesus to be my friend. You'll get to that point where that stuff will just, I mean, it still hurts. Yeah, absolutely, it'll still hurt. But you know what? You'll just say, it doesn't even bother me like it used to. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. And a lot of these modern professing Christians, the reason they're so concerned about what they say and how they look and whatever is because they've never been born again. They don't care about Jesus being their friend. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life, and who is sufficient for these things. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Uh, out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth will speak. You have Jesus in your heart, it will come out your mouth. Come out of your mouth. Okay? But notice it says there, To the one we are the savor of death unto death. Who would that be? That's in them that perish. Okay? The people that are lost, that are dying. They're dead in trespasses and sins. Um, they look at us and they say, "What? All you talk about is this negative stuff all the time, and just you're not even fun to be around anymore. You don't want to smoke pot with me. You don't want to come over and play video games anymore. You don't want to. It just everything's wrong. Don't watch. You burned your Hollywood movies. Are you serious? What, and what's with the way you're dressed? What? What's going on with you? You're weird. What happened? You just remind them of death. Oh, just I'm. Um, you're dying to the world. You see." And to the other, the savor of life unto life. When you actually meet a real born-again Christian. And there's not many of us. <laughs> Let me tell you, the Lord has us spread out right now. It's kind of an interesting little thing because the Jews are dispersed. They're spread out. And the prophecy for the end times is God starts to bring them back to their land because of the covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the Christians, we were once together, and formed a good, strong unit. I mean, you go back into the early 1900s even, and you go into any church building out there, they'd be singing the old hymns, you know, the old hymns. They'd sing those, and they'd be reading out of King, the King James Bible and preaching very similar to each other. You know, you go into a Lutheran or a Presbyterian or a Methodist or a Baptist or whatever, Presbyterian or something, you go into those types of places, it would be very similar. Now, not even close. I mean, there's all kinds of wicked stuff going on in these church buildings. But you see, if you can find somebody that's a savor of life unto life, well, that's a wonderful thing. So there's no condemnation to you if you have friends. It's not, well, then you shouldn't be having friends as a Christian. You know, you're compromising. No, if you can find somebody who's genuinely born again, absolutely have them as your friend. It's wonderful. But um, don't feel bad and don't beat yourself up if you don't have that many friends. Um, Luke chapter 23, turn there next. So you want to avoid people that come after you for your money. You want to avoid people that are there trying to pull you back into the world. You want to avoid those two groups. If you're looking for a friend, Luke chapter 23, verse 8 through 12. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracles, some miracle done by him. Then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. 
And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod, with his men of war, set him at naught, and mocked him, and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him again to Pilate. And the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves. Um, <laughs> this is a weird one, okay? Uh, and I have been the unfortunate you know, recipient of this one many times, where, what do you have here? Um, Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Um, <clears throat> there are people that will start out watching me, watching this ministry, and they'll say, wow, you know, this guy really knows the Bible. Man, it's such a blessing to see, you know, Brother Brian, and, and he's just doing all this great stuff. Then I say something that steps on their toes, and they come along, and it says here, verse 9, Then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. Um, nothing, <laughs> whatever you people say out there. I have a weird accent. I get it. But uh, people come along, and they'll, they'll try to corner me and, and things. You know, and sometimes it's just the spirit within me just says, uh, okay, you know, I can't answer some people because I've covered it in so many sermons. I've, I've already just said this stuff, and I think I can't say anything more to you. It, I don't know what else I'm supposed to say. And you'll experience this thing, that there are times when people come, they have a legitimate question, a legit, legitimate concern or whatever. Fine, absolutely ask your questions. And you start to try to talk to them, but then you'll get these other times that they, they just come, and you can tell in your spirit, they're just trying to trap me. They're just trying to catch me in my words to try to make me look bad. And you just kind of go, you know, you don't say anything. Again, I've had that. Verse 10, and the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Oh boy, the accusations that have come against me over the years. And they'll come against you. Again, what's happened to me, it's going to happen to you. You stand for this King James Bible and things like the Godhead Doctrine or the Resurrection bef being before the time of Jacob's trouble, um, the Bible version issue itself, you know, uh, Roman Catholicism is wicked, you know, all the different things that we stand for as Bible believers. The uh, religious people out there, the scribes and chief priests, will stand and vehemently accuse you. Definitely. Verse 11, And Herod was with his men... Of war set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. Yeah, you know, there are videos of me where they have cut up my words and they set me at naught. Don't talk to Denlinger, he's a heretic, he's a this guy's a buffoon, he's a this, he's that, and they make fun of me. Uh, John Davis, that I used to consider a friend, I've talked about him in other studies, puts all kinds of things, Christmas little Christmas ornaments in my beard, makes fun of me, puts me out in front of some old hut and whatever. Sets me at naught there and mocked him. Yeah, they'll mock me. Verse 12, In the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves. Uh, I remember, remember uh, Jeremy Carter uh, used to do videos with him and things, and, and um, this uh, John Kalau guy, Max Bauer on YouTube, and Jeremy Carter, you know, he'd question people's salvation if they had anything to do with this guy. And uh, after we had a falling out and whatever else, he went over and he was doing videos with this guy that he once used to hate. And they became friends. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, okay, now well, that makes sense, you know. And I've seen it. Again, I've seen it with so many different people. People that used to support this ministry and they go and they, get, they start to talk behind my back. Oh, he hasn't answered this and he hasn't answered that because he knows he's guilty. And off they go. Once we're friends, as Bible believers, learn so much from me, and then they turn and they accuse me and they become friends with my enemies. It's going to happen to you. So, well, brother, I'm not in real public ministry like you are and whatever else, but the devil will get people to start going against you. You're going to church someplace, some church building, you'll experience it there. You get into the popular little clique, you know, the pastor's inner circle, or you get the pulpit mentions, you know, from Sunday morning. And I just wanted to say, you know, I was really blessed by brother so-and-so down there. And he really did some good things at the church this past week and all this other stuff. And 
well, you know, I'm in the inner circle. And then you get really high in the inner circle. You actually go to the pastor's house for, you know, Sunday afternoon for the meal and everything else. I've been there numerous times with different pastors. You know, the faithful, the holy faithful Brian Dunlinger, you know. <laughs> and then, you, you know, you do something wrong and it's a, uh, well, brother, I think you should be careful about that. Well, I'm just asking a question, you know. Well, I don't understand why this is being done or that. Well, that's the way we do it here at this church, you know. And then you get, you know, eventually it asked to leave and then you're out and you're out there and then it's you know you're not getting the pulpit mentions anymore and positively you're now getting preached you know your great sins are being aired out before everybody and yeah i remember the last baptist church i went to and um, we were there and i was in the inner circle for sure and i would preach when he wasn't there and everything else and oh the holy brian denlinger um the most beloved and all this other stuff and then we got on the outs with them and we left. And, and I remember this one older couple uh, that actually had gotten saved from one of the times I was preaching. And, um, and they called, up, called us up. We weren't there, but they left the thing on the answering machine. And they said, there was a lot of stuff said about you. And we just wanted you to know we weren't for it. And um, we're not going to be going back there again. You know, something to that effect. It's been so many years ago. I don't remember the whole story. But uh, yeah, yeah. And you make a lot of uh, friends in that church building structure. They come together. Uh, they used to be with you, and now they've joined together to come against you. And you get shunned. And then you see them out in public and whatever, and they used to be, you know, hey, buddy, hey, brother, how you doing? How's it been? I've been praying for you and whatever. You see them out in public, and they, they look at, you know, and they'll, they'll walk right past you, you know, and, and you, you know, hi. <laughs> and it's just, <laughs> Uh, not real friends. Not real friends. But let's finish up the study here with going over some true friends. Marks of a true friend. Proverbs chapter 18. Go back there in the Old Testament. It's like kind of ironic. There's not a whole lot in the New Testament about friends. Most references in your King James Bible to friend or friends are actually in the Old Testament. In the Gospels, you know, before Jesus died on the cross, that's all doctrinally in the Old Testament. The uh, New Testament comes in with the death of the testator. See Hebrews chapter 9 to prove that. So just kind of an odd thing. You'd think that you'd be more friendly and more friends and whatever in the New Testament. Because the Old Testament's all the, you know, going and warring with people and everything else. Uh, no, not so. Um, Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 24 says here, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Um, what is a true friend? Uh, one that is closer to you than family. Yeah, I've had a few of those over the years. You know, there's some that we part company, we go our separate ways. They are moving this way, I'm moving that way and whatever else. But I've, I've had brethren that I was in ministry with in years past and closer to me than my actual physical blood brothers and siblings pretty amazing there but it says a man that hath friends must show himself friendly um, there is some give and take there uh, you give of yourself to your friends but they have to also give to you that's how that's a kind of a reciprocal thing there if it's all just you giving to them that's not really friendship either uh, there has to be some things of charity there giving of your time to one another. But uh, that's what the verse is saying there. Don't forget that. Proverbs chapter 27. We'll go there next. So a mark of a true friend would be self-sacrifice and closer than family members. And you get pretty close to a family member. You know, you have the blood ties there and whatever else in terms of, you know, you're of the same blood and, and whatever. That's what I'm saying. Um, Proverbs 27, verses 5 through 10. Let's read that. It says here, Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. The full soul loatheth in honeycomb, but to the hungry soul every bitter thing is sweet. As a bird that wandereth from her nest, so is a man that wandereth from his place. Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart, so doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. Hmm. Thine own friend and thy father's friend forsake not. 
Neither go into thy brother's house in the day of thy calamity, for better is a neighbor that is near than a brother far off. Interesting, because all my brothers are far off. <laughs> They're way other parts of the country. You know, physical brothers, and even my wife's brothers. They're in other states. Thankful for that. Um, and for my own as well, but uh, another issue. But um, you see there the thing of that there is a hearty counsel in from a friend. And it says there in verse 6, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Um, you know what one of the most important aspects of a true friend is? Honesty. Be honest with me. You consider me to be a friend? You say, you're, I'm a friend of the ministry. I, I love Brother Brian and I, I love his teachings and everything else. Then be faithful. Be faithful to tell me when I'm wrong. Do it in a loving, kind way and whatever. I mean, if I've really messed up badly or something, well, to come to me in private and say, hey, brother, write me a letter through the mail or whatever else. And just wanted to say, I saw you said this or that or whatever, or somebody accused you of this. Could you answer this thing? Whatever. Brother, I think you're getting a little bit too angry and you're getting the world, the world, the, the negative stuff of the world, I think is starting to affect your preach. Be honest with me. Um, you know, just tell you real quick here. Um, there have been times I've had really bad arguments with my wife. And she's my very best friend in this world. Um, her and, and my son. But, you know, wife, husband and wife, there's that relationship there. We're one flesh. But there have been times that she has, you know, open rebuked me you know, between the two of us. And um, I've gotten mad. Oh boy, have I gotten mad. And, you know, I yell and, you know, get really angry about it. And, you know, who are you to tell me that way? You don't talk to me like, you know, the whole thing. And she's very kind with it. She doesn't, you know, she doesn't overstep her bounds as my wife. But you know what? I'll go off. And I've made her cry many times being an idiot. You know, me being an idiot to her. And there are times I go off and I'm just, Lord, I can't believe that she'd say, oh, you know, why would you bring me a wife like this? And I'm you know, getting angry. And the Lord starts to deal with me. And the Lord starts to say, take my ear, you know, like you do with a little brat like this. Uh, Lord, what are you doing? She's right. <laughs> I need to grab your nose and twist it. Ow, 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 ow. <sighs> and all of a sudden I start to think about the wounds that she gave me. The things that she hurt me with made me angry, whatever. And I start to think, yeah, you know what? She's right in what she said. I do need to work harder at that. Hmm. And some of you out there, you've rebuked me in a loving manner. I'm trying to be more cognizant of standing straighter. I have a terrible time with slouching over like this. And one of you wrote in the comments and said, you really need to stand up straighter. Um, it's not good for your health. It's not really professional and whatever else. Stand up straight. Speak clearly. <sighs> okay. Uh, when you're reading through the scriptures, brother, slow it down a little bit. You know, don't don't read so quickly. It's a little hard for us that English isn't our first language. You know, I got that the one time. Try to remind myself, you know. I'm always thinking about I have to get this done and get that done and I have all this stuff to do. It. Slow down with the word of God. <laughs> Take it easy. I appreciate that. If you're a friend of the ministry and you have some kind of an issue with me, please tell me. So you might get mad. Yeah, I might. But you know what? I'll listen. And if you're right in what you're saying, the Lord's going to start to convict me. Get me by the ear and say, okay, little brat, you need to change this. And if I have to, if it's some serious thing, I will come out and publicly apologize. I've done it many times on this channel and admitted to a fault that I have been doing. That's the way it is. Go down to verse 17 in the same chapter there. Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 17. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Um, if you just see me in error, doctrinal error, and you let me go, I'm never going to be corrected in that. But if you come along and you say, actually, brother, just a little correction here. You said this, and the Bible says something opposite. Well, did I misquote that or something? Yeah, you did. You misquoted it. Oh, I'll remember that. Iron sharpeneth iron. 
So give me a practical example. Okay. Here's the way it's supposed to look with two Christians together. Take my Cromwell sword and my Viking sword here. <laughs> so I don't knock anything over here. As we parlay back and forth. Well, the Bible says, well, yes, but the Bible also says, you see, and these aren't sharp swords, so don't get excited. That's why I didn't pick up the, this one here behind me. <laughs> but these are just mostly for looks here in, in my office. That's iron sharpening iron. Going through the scriptures together. Why? Because we're pre preparing each other for battle. That's a good thing to be prepared for the working out there and, and doing the Lord's work and things. There we go, that way. If you care about somebody, you'll warn them and get them ready. Hey, brother, uh, I just found out that so-and-so uh, over on such-and-such -such channel, this channel over there, they're attacking you. And I went into the comments and I tried to stand up for you and whatever else, but they said they're going to come after you. Let, let me know about stuff. Let me know if people are attacking me or trying to go after the ministry here or whatever else. Please. I really appreciate that. Acts chapter 19. Go back to the New Testament now. And we'll look at a few other things about true friendship. You know, and by the way, anytime at all, some of my older friends out there, people that used to watch this ministry, you're welcome back anytime. You really are. You come back, you demonstrate repentance. You say, yeah, I was wrong about this and I should have never left your ministry and I'm sorry and I've been out listening to these crazy kooks or whatever else that tried to, you know, they're always attacking you and, and things. They're obsessed with watching you, but yet they say not to watch you. Uh, yeah, come back. Take what I say. Take Listen to what I'm saying. You know, take the good things that are in line with Scripture. Say, well, you know, Brother Brian, at least he tries. He's an idiot sometimes, but at least he's trying. You know, but you go out there and you say, well, he was my friend, but now he isn't anymore. Why? Do you have good reason for it? Are you making alliances there, Pilate and Herod? I sure hope not. Acts 19, verse 30 and 31. I mean, if you, I'll just say this one other thing here before I read the passage. If you leave this ministry and all of a sudden you're finding yourself with friends and these friends are getting you to become messed up and you're putting down the King James Bible and you're not singing the old hymns and things are starting to fall apart, you might want to repent and return to where you fell from. You might want to come back to this ministry and realize that when I'm rebuking sin, I'm not attacking you personally. You see, I'm your friend and faithful are the wounds that I give you with the sword of the Spirit. I want to sharpen iron sharpening iron I want you to be an effective soldier for Jesus Christ and this is the best I can do I can't you know I get some church building someplace it would just be contention and fighting and the whole thing there's no scripture for it either so you know I do my best to reach out to the brothers and sisters out there uh, Acts chapter 19 verse 30 and 31 says and when Paul would have entreated or entered in unto the people the disciples suffered him not and certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Um, kind of an interesting thing because it just means the, like the assembly of where the people were at there, the theater, um, where they would give orations and whatever. But uh, now, you know, I think it's a good thing for friends to warn others about going and seeing movies. Don't go to the theater, you know, the modern day theater. But uh, more than that, a friend will warn you. A true friend will say, uh, yeah, I'm going to wound you with you know, kind scriptural rebukes, iron sharpening iron, going back and forth. But if I see something happening, I'm going to let you know about it. I'm going to let you warn, or I'm going to, to warn you. Um, told this story years, many years ago. Uh, excuse me, many years ago. I uh, had a guy, it was Marine Force Recon, I think, or something. And he wrote me a, a uh, private letter, I think, or it's been so many years ago. This is before I even knew my wife. 
And he said, um, brother, he said, I just wanted to let you know, um, you need to be real careful with what you're saying because you are on a list. Um, he said, I can't tell you who it's connected to or whatever else, but he said, you're definitely on a list. You know, that would basically be, you know, targeted, uh, taken down or whatever else. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, hey, uh, we want you to come to some speaking conference in the future or something. Oh, okay. And some of you out there, you hear and you, and I'm being deceived and I don't know any better or whatever. And, and you say, hey, brother, um, I heard that you said you're going to be speaking at this conference. Are you aware who puts that on? No. <laughs> you know, well, let me show you who puts that conference on. I don't think you want to go there. Don't go to the theater. Thank you. I appreciate that. Hey, brother, um, I actually heard that there's some, you know, plans that the UN has for your area up there because there's a national monument right over there to my west. I mean, literally, yeah, pretty much directly west of where I'm standing right now. And uh, most of the national monuments here in America are UN bio reserves. Hey, brother, I did a little bit of research, did a little bit of checking into this. And uh, yeah, they want to take the whole area over. They want to push everybody out of the area. Please be advised. Thank you. Appreciate that. I saw somebody in the comments and they said, Brother, um, this Hurricane Lee or something, it's supposed to be here, I think, in two days or something like that. They said, praying that that doesn't get to you. Or, you know, please be careful. Make sure, you know, batten down the hatches, so to speak. Make sure that you have things secured and whatever. I mean, I'm not really worried about it. It's very far down to the coast. Uh, many hours drive down south, uh, southeast from where I'm at. And... Um, so I'm not really worried about this hurricane that's coming, but thank you for warning me. Hey, brother, did you see the thing about Jordan Peterson? I saw one of you say this uh, about how his in his office he has a big, huge painting of uh, Lenin, I think it is. Really? I went to Google and I typed it in. Wow, yeah, admires communists. Has a whole collection of communist-era paintings. That's a little bizarre. Hey, brother, did you hear? Warn me. Let me know. If you do, then thank you, friend. I appreciate that. Finally, Acts chapter 27. We'll go there. Acts chapter 27 and verse 3. It says here, In the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go unto his friends to refresh himself. Um, being with friends should be refreshing. Uh, it should be some kind scriptural rebukes. It should be iron sharpening iron. It should be warning. It should be um, feeling there that you're closer than family, that we have a spiritual tie, the fellowship of the spirit that's there. You say, well, brother, um, that's the funny thing. You see, I don't have any of that. Uh, I'm all alone. I'm uh, married to somebody that's lost. I'm in a home where all my siblings and my parents they all make fun of me. I'm the only one. I'm an older woman and I don't have a husband. Single older woman. I'm a... Uh, get down through the list. I know a lot of you are having some really bad problems. And you say, I, brother, I don't have many friends. Yeah, I don't either. Um, but do you have Jesus as your friend? I hope so. Don't forget that. He's your friend. There's some old hymns that talk about it. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Written by Joseph Scriven in 1855. And uh, Joseph Scriven, if you don't know the story about him, um, <clears throat> he was from Ireland, I think it was, going to be married. And the night before the wedding, his wife was riding her horse down near a river, fell off the horse, went into the river, hit her head on a rock, drowned. Uh, he was heartbroken, and he left Ireland and went to Canada. 
and he was there and just single guy living by himself for a while and uh, met a nice family and they had a beautiful young daughter and he was going to get married to her and she got sick and died. <laughs> All right, so what a friend we have in Jesus. Hey, Joseph Scriven, 1855. A lot more Christians back then, a lot more good people. Even the lost people were had better morals than professing Christians of the day. Um, good place. How many friends do you have? Jesus. <clears throat> Another hymn here. Just grabbing these, my different hymn books here and things. If you've seen the last video on the reviewing the hymn book, the uh, Psalms and Hymns and Spiritual Songs by Melody Publications, right here, like that. But I'm going to sing from my old one here. Another hymn. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day, without him I would fall. When I am sad, to him I go, no other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad, he's my friend. Jesus is my friend. Jesus is your friend if you're saved. Don't forget that. You're more than a servant now, you're a friend. And finally, from the new hymn book, <clears throat> Saved, Saved, written in uh, 1911. Okay, it says here, the lines were penned in 1911 during evangelistic meetings in which Schofield uh, assisted in the music. Of the occasion, he said, the melody just came to me almost as a gift. Then I simply tried to make the words fit the tune. It was popular from the start. And this is how it goes. I found a friend who is all to me. His love is ever true. I love to tell how he lifted me and what his grace can do for you. Saved by his power divine, saved to new life sublime. Night life now is sweet and my joy is complete, for I'm saved, saved, saved. I've found a friend who is all to me. Don't feel bad if you don't have many friends, because they come very uh, few and far between now. Um, you're not mentally ill. You're not uh, some kind of uh, manic depressive or socially uh, outcast, awkward. No. Uh, you're autistic. You're Asperger syndrome. You have uh, bipolar. Di no, no. <laughs> um, I can't compromise. And I won't compromise. I'm, I can't change the fact that to these people out there, I'm a saver of death unto death. I can't change it. Um, and someday we're going to have a beloved, wonderful reunion in heaven. And I want to be faithful to my friend with my life here on earth when, so that when I eventually see him face to face, um, I'm not going to have to be ashamed before him at his coming. Um, I'm not going to be ashamed of his word, my King James Bible. And you want to talk about quick separation from professing Christians? This is the book that will do it. Right here. You just come out and you say, I believe this book's perfect. Oh, 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 you believe in double inspiration? I, I believe it's perfect. Well, what about this Greek word here? What about the... Uh, it's perfect. You see, I have a personal relationship with my best friend, Jesus, you know? And he guides me and he proves this book to me over and over again. It's like a love letter from Jesus to me. You won't take my book from me and you won't take my friend from me. Well... I think you really need to go out there and you need to meet people. I mean, what aren't you, you, know, you need to get in church. Isn't your boy going to Sunday school, Brian? You know, oh, oh, he should be in Sunday school. He needs friends. He needs to have other friends. Oh, you mean the friends that will uh, 
sneak some pornography and show my son, like what happened to me when I was a little boy? Yo, know, you mean the friends that'll that'll uh, have me over to their house, have him over to their house and uh, show him Hollywood movies when his parents wouldn't be for it? Yo, know, you mean friends like that? You mean friends, uh, peers at school that'll try to smoke a cigarette and say, hey, try this. Like what happened to me? Well, those kind of friends? Because otherwise my son, you know, he might turn out awkward. <laughs> uh, the funny thing is, I was exposed to friends growing up, worldly friends, while going to church, you know, very, uh, lots of friends in public school, lots of friends in Sunday school. I was exposed to the friends, yet I turned out more socially awkward than my son that's not exposed to friends. He's played with a handful of children in his whole life. And yet he'll go and he'll strike up conversations with adults at stores and he'll talk to people and things. And we'll go to stores sometimes and, and they'll start talking about a subject and he'll stand there and he'll, well, yeah, it's, I find this is interesting and that, you know, whatever. And, and I've seen, you know, adults and they say, wow, I can't believe he's saying this. This boy is intelligent. Wow, young man, how do you know this stuff? And, well, I, I study things. I like to read books. And I, you know, my father, he shows me videos and things that kind of reinforce what it, and, and <laughs> don't let society tell you that you have to have friends to be normal, that you have to have friends to fit in and that you're somehow a bad Christian because you don't have many friends. Uh, that's nonsense. That's not true. Your main responsibility is to have one friend. And you're right with him, then it's up to him to bring other friends into your life. But you don't ever compromise on that friendship. Jesus Christ is all the world to me. My life, my joy, my all. He is my friend from day to day. Without him I would fall. When I am sad, to him I go. No other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad. He's my friend. I hope that this has been a blessing to you. And um, to those of you out there that are suffering, and there's a lot of you, uh, there's a lot of you that are very alone, um, just stick with it. Stick with the Word of God. Sing the old hymns. The two books, brethren. This will keep you in line. You start to fall apart. You get led away by the Herods and the Pilots, by the mocking soldiers of the devil that seek you to turn, seek to turn you away from this ministry. Um, and you see your life falling apart. Come back. I recommend that. Um, take things from me, brethren. Again, understand. I don't. I'm not perfect. Understand that. But I try my best. And um, so I hope that this has been something that you'll remember and that you won't let people put you down, relatives and whoever else, because you don't have friends. Um, that is going to be it. And um, stay strong because the days we're going into are very tough. What else is new? <laughs> uh, we're more than conquerors, brethren. Don't worry about it. You have a friend with connections. He knows what you're going through. He knows how to protect you. Oh, they're going to pass this legislation. The Jesuits are forming this, and the Bilderbergers said that, and the Club of Rome, and the, well, I don't even know if the Club of Rome's active that much anymore, but the World Economic Forum, that's the new one. Um, they have all these bad things. Yeah, yeah. My friend will take care of them. And yours will too if you're born again. We'll see you in the next video.